I'm Scott L. Miller. This is Sam IT, and after a long hiatus, we're back on the channel, and I want to apologize for taking a long time off. I've had a lot of things going on in my life, all, for the most part, pretty good. As many of you know, we have had COVID for the last few years, and during that time, I made the very large life decision to move to another country, buy a hotel and a restaurant, and embark on a lot of new life adventures. And so there has been quite a bit of time that we've not been recording on the channel, and I really apologize because I miss being here, and I'm ready to be back. We do not have a studio set up any anywhere here in the country. And so because of that, I decided finally that I just had to start recording outside. There's just no other way to be able to do it. But our earliest episodes were done outside and nobody seemed to care. It's about the content. We're gonna get started today with our first return episode talking about the scam of Microsoft calling you because your computer has been hacked. Let's get started. All right, so this is a common very common thing. I've had it happen to me. Someone will call you out of the blue. Oh, your Windows machine has been hacked. We've detected that you've been hacked. Let us get into your computer and help you out. For me, it's easy to know that this couldn't be real because I don't have a Windows computer. I have no Microsoft product. How could Microsoft know? Obviously, if they did, something would be really wrong. I would definitely be hacked if Microsoft knew. So, it's easy for me, but for most people who have Microsoft devices, especially if you're getting called at work, it's easy to think maybe Microsoft has detected something and has contacted you. Maybe I should let them into my computer, tell them something about my company, and we will try to fix the problem with their help. This is a really common social engineering tactic, and I want to talk about how some critical thinking around this can expose why this is not possible as a thing. Not because this one particular scam is going to be something you're going to have to face over and over again. It's understanding how this kind of scam works can do a lot to allow us to learn how to avoid other scams and similar social engineering situations in the future. So let's look at what goes into this particular scam. All right, the very first thing, let's start with how does Microsoft know any of this? The biggest thing, how do they know your phone number? Of course, when you get Windows, you do not give Microsoft your phone number. At no point ever in the purchase of Windows do you give Microsoft your phone number, your email, or anything else. They do not know how to contact you at all. They also don't know what computer you're using, nor do they know where you are. So any of those things, if they try to put them together, it doesn't make sense that Microsoft is going to reach out to you. Even if you were breached, even if they wanted to reach out to you, they don't know how. That's the first thing. Anybody who reaches out saying that they're Microsoft, unless you reached out to them, it certainly is not Microsoft or any other vendor. This stuff applies universally. Don't think of this as just being about Microsoft. We're just using them as an example here. Second, how do they know you were breached? There's no way for them to know that. They don't even know what breached is. What behavior on your computer constitutes being breached? And if they did know that, first of all, that would be a crime, a big one, because it would mean that they had to hack your computer to have your personal information, to know who you are and that things are being done on your computer that they don't like. How would they know whether you wanted it to be done or not? They wouldn't, they can't, they're saying, that something, just the thing they're saying is impossible. If they had that access, of course, they wouldn't tell you because they would expose that they had information they shouldn't have. But more importantly, if they were actually being altruistic and they had this information that your computer was hacked or there was attempted to be hacked, why didn't they stop it? If they have the, the knowledge to do all these things, they certainly could have stopped it or cleaned it up or fixed it without involving you. They don't need to know, get access to the computer because they're claiming they already have access. So something's clearly wrong in all of these steps. Now let's step back for a second. I wanna use an analogy. What we're thinking is happening is much like this. Imagine that you live in a house and you've lived in that house for some time and one day a guy who looks not, you'd have no idea who he is. He has no credentials whatsoever. He doesn't look like someone you've ever met. He knocks on your door, you open up the door and he says, hi, I'm your general contractor. I built your house and I believe you are currently being robbed. If you could uh, let me in, I've detected that you're being robbed through the miracle of the, of the magic hammers that I used. So please let me into your house and while I'm in the house, give me access to all your things in the house, all your secret documents, your, your keys, your car, your garage, all those things. You just stand back and watch me from a distance or pay no attention actually, you just go somewhere else. If you could leave, give me some secret access 
and I'm just gonna poke around and make sure everything's okay. Trust me, because I'm your general contractor, it makes sense that I know how your house is being used now many years later. And the fact that you don't remember me um, or have never given me permission to monitor your house uh, and that you have no idea who I am and I don't know who you are, that's irrelevant. Just give me unfettered access and if you could leave your banking information out on the kitchen table, that would be great. Thanks. That is effectively what's going on here. Microsoft is like a general contractor. They built the house that you use for all your things, your operating system, but they don't know how it's being used, where it's deployed, what you intend to do with it, or even who you are. None of this information is something that is relevant to them. It's also important that just like the general contractor, they're not a security professional. They're not there to monitor things, even if they were, um, someone who did that, you didn't contract them to do those things. So it's neither your security company nor a security related company. That's simply not part of Microsoft's job either. They're not an IT firm, they're a software firm. These are very different things. Your IT firm is someone who manages that component of your business. They're one of the most important pieces of your business. You should be dealing with them essentially every day. They should be part of every business decision you make. You should know them personally. They should be a huge part of your team. They may not be an internal employee, they may be external, that's completely fine, but they absolutely are not gonna be a random third party who doesn't do IT, who just shows up one day and says, hey, I wanna make critical IT decisions and definitely give me the keys to the kingdom without even knowing who I am. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think, an important analogy because that's really what it's like. It's, you, you really have to picture, oh my gosh, I don't know who this person is calling. I have no reason to think that they're Microsoft. They said it, no one else said it. They don't act like they're Microsoft. It doesn't make sense for Microsoft to do these things. It would be wrong for Microsoft to have access to all these things. All of those pieces, all of that, something is wrong at every step. And lastly, Microsoft is a business. Their job is to make money. Calling you, monitoring all these things, even if all of this was legal, even if all of this was possible, to think that Microsoft would pour resources that would cost billions, truly billions of dollars into monitoring the largest fleet of consumer computers in the world and then taking the time to contact them. For an IT firm to do that, that phone call costs hundreds of dollars to make. It requires, if it was real, it requires an extreme level of infrastructure, an insane amount of monitoring, all kinds of inside information, and a lot of expertise. A lot of expertise that's not widely available on the market. Anyone who was doing this would require trillions of dollars of, of uh, resources, of human resources, of payroll to be able to cover a fleet the size of Microsoft. You're talking about roughly 50 to 75 percent of the entire global IT industry would have to be put into this one task because every company is already tasked with doing those things and that's a huge amount of where their money goes. So we're talking about an insane amount of money. It's, it's simply financially impossible for Microsoft to do, but it also doesn't make sense. If Microsoft's out there to make money, sure, they might call you and say, wouldn't it be great if you paid us to do some work? That would kind of make sense if all the other things were legal and possible. Yes, if they use it as a revenue source, sure. But hey, we're gonna for free reach out, we're gonna log into your computer, we're gonna risk it going to jail, and all to do really expensive work for free? Seriously. None of this makes any sense. There's no way any, every one of these pieces is enough to completely rule this out as a real thing. And what's important is understanding that each of these pieces is important for ruling out other scams as well. How did they reach you? Why did they reach you? Why did you accept the call in the first place? This is another really important piece because in every case that I know, how did this call get to you is an important question to ask because it's a point in which we could protect ourselves, at least theoretically. Unsolicited calls, unsolicited emails coming to us. Now it's not spam, it's not bulk necessarily, although in this case it is. But because it's unsolicited and coming to us, we should not be reading it. This is just general life advice. Unsolicited emails, unsolicited phone calls, don't accept them and you will protect yourself against a giant number of these social engineering attacks. There, and it's, some of them are much more legitimate, right? There are so many things like actual salespeople who actually have a product to sell. Yes, they're gonna scam you in a lot of ways. This is how they reach you, right? They came without a reference. I didn't bother looking for a good company to do something, I just let them contact me. That is a really bad process. Sometimes you try and try and you can't find someone who sells you a certain part and then miraculously a salesman for that part calls you 
hey, if it's something you really can't find, maybe you just got lucky, maybe this is the only option and you're gonna get scammed and it, it is what it is. But in general, you don't ever go with the company that reaches out to you. If you get an unsolicited email, an unsolicited phone call, hey, we're, we're a company that sells this product, we do this thing, we have this great thing, you should use us. That, if you discover that the thing that they're selling is something you need, then go and seek out that solution or product or whatever on your own, evaluate it. Do not use the company that called you. Now, if you do all that and it turns out that the company who called you comes up as a highly recommended and trusted source and they just happen to call you, okay, you unbelievable coincidence, but good enough. Like that's okay, don't rule them out, I guess, but never use the fact that you are contacted in an unsolicited way as a way to determine what you're going to do. That is a dangerous, dangerous process and you can protect yourself against so many things simply by never allowing that to happen. Now, who is the company? Who are the people that you should be calling if something like this happens? Whether it's before it happens, I'm, I believe I may have been breached, I'm concerned about my security posture, I want to ensure I'm safe, or, oh my gosh, I took this call from someone claiming to be Microsoft or Apple or whoever, and now I'm afraid of what I've done, who should I talk to? This is what your IT department is for. And you should always have that as an established relationship, right? If, and, and this lesson goes for right now. If you're watching this video and you don't have an IT relationship with somebody, it is your job, whether you're a consumer and you just need to know who to call. Well, I got this guy, he's knowledgeable, he cares, I pay him a little bit of money or it's a friend of mine. Great, have that relationship set up. But if you're a business, you need to have that really, really solid few things are as critical for your company as your IT relationship. Certainly some things are more important, but it's up there. It is very important and you need to have it established now, not when a problem arises. Because when a problem arises, they're not going to have the access they need, they're not going to have the monitoring they need, they're not going to have the knowledge of your network that they need, and you're not going to have the trust that you need, and you're going to be susceptible to a lot of things. If something comes up, you need to know that you can call your trusted IT department, whether it's someone you deal with every day or it's just once in a while, hey guys, uh, I'm afraid I've been breached, what do I do? Or I'm afraid I'm going to be breached, how do I protect myself? That's what they're there for, that's their jobs. A random person who calls you, and offers you free service is certainly not your friend. Get your IT in a row, find those right resources, trust them, never allow someone to bypass them by simply calling you uh, or emailing you or anything and just don't even respond, never respond. Not sometimes, not once in a while, not rarely, never. Don't even read the mails. If it's unsolicited, if you don't know who it is, if you don't have an established relationship, if they're not looking to buy products from you, if, unless they're a new customer and you're a salesperson, then absolutely life lesson across the board, do not do business with them. Simply delete the email instantly, maybe block, maybe mark as spam, but do not read it, do not engage with it, do not mentally connect with it. Don't give yourself the chance to possibly pick up the phone or respond by email or whatever hang up, delete, whatever it takes, that's the secret. And that's one of the ways that IT professionals typically keep themselves safe. And people ask, you're in IT, how, how come IT people are safer? What are you doing differently? And certainly, even IT people, there's flies flying around, even IT people are sometimes going to get tricked. It happens, but we have procedures and we're used to this stuff all the time. And knowing that unsolicited communications are extremely dangerous is simply part and parcel with dealing with computers or phones or mail or even snail mail. You get a letter in the mail and it's not from someone you know, throw it away. Don't open it, don't read it, don't wonder if it's real. It's not. It's not a thing. Unsolicited, any communications, it's not your problem. It's not yours to deal with. There are things the government knows how to reach you, your vendors know how to reach you, your friends know how to reach you, your family knows how to reach you, and you know who they are. Random people just shooting in the dark and hoping you, you open your mail and open your email and answer the phone and decide to trust them because you randomly communicated with them, they're dangerous. Run away, 
right away. Thank you for joining me. I'm so glad to be back on the channel. If you have any questions, always comment below. Have you been uh, scammed like this? I'm sure you've had customers who've had this. I have this regularly and I try to tell people, uh, here's things you can do. Uh, you know, reach out to us proactively. Uh, give us a, you know, it's a terrible situation. And of course, when this happens, I'm going to add at the end now, right? This is the things you need to know. We've talked about what you need to know for when it's going to happen, but it has happened. And you're talking to your IT guys. And what's the answer? What do you do? Now, do you, uh, you know, run a virus scan, scan, see if there's something on your computer? No, don't do any of that stuff. You nuke it from orbit, as we say, you simply wipe the computer, you reinstall the operating system, or if it's an old computer, consider getting a new one, a new one that's okay, right? A new one might be $400, wiping the old one might be $300, eh, 100 bucks, new computer, done, right? It's a perfect time to consider an upgrade. That's just fine, that's, that's not a problem. What you don't want to do is start trying to fix the computer. This is a dangerous process for two reasons. One, it racks up billable hours and fast. And two, there's no way to know for sure that you're safe. There isn't a way to know, period, full stop. There is no gray area on maybe we know. Yeah, the whole thing's a gray area. Maybe you're safe, but you don't know. That's the key. You will black and white never know whole bunch of gray area. Are you, are you still in, at risk? We don't know. But not knowing is not a situation you can go to. You could do no work and not know. Don't pay for someone to leave you in the same unknown situation that you started with. The only proper procedure, because once a computer is compromised to that level, you simply don't know when you've gotten it clean. The computer could report anything. It could force software installed on it to report anything. There's no, there's lots of, yeah, a really good set of cleaning processes have a chance of protecting you, but it's only a chance. And anyone who tells you that they know for sure is lying. And the reason that they will lie is because there are giant numbers of billable hours potential in trying to clean a computer. It's a great way to rack up big bills and have no verifiable results to deliver at the end. In fact, you could rack up six hours of work and do absolutely nothing and it would look exactly the same as if someone had done a whole bunch of work. It's kids in a candy store, right? Oh my gosh, we have customers who will pay us to do anything and we have no visible deliverables. How great is that? It's not like normal IT work on day-to-day -day basis where it's like, oh, can you make this server do this? Can you deploy this great thing? Yeah, it takes all kinds of work. You get it wrong, it doesn't work. And you, you know, it's, it's stressful. This kind of work is so easy because the customer has no way to know if you do anything. That's why you wipe and you start over every time no exceptions. That's how it works. It's fast. It's as cost effective as you can get. And it is the, it is reliable and safe. That's it. So that's the answer. So when your IT guy tells you, oh, I think we, be we better wipe your computer. And he's struggling because he doesn't want to have to tell you that because he knows that most customers are going to react with, really, can't you clean it? Don't say that to him. He's trying to tell you the truth. And he's afraid of you because we all are. Right? It is, it is stressful to tell customers something they don't want to hear, especially during a stressful situation, but that's the real answer. Be wary of someone claiming to be an IT who's not looking out for your interests and is like, well, I guess I could clean it for you. It'll just leave you at risk. If they tell you how much risk you'll be at and you're like, no, clean it anyway. Okay, you know what? If you pay me enough, I'll do the thing you tell me to do too. Against my advice, that was a truck. Um, but their advice should always be to wipe and start over. So listen to that advice. They are not kidding. They're not making it up. That is actually the process. As much as it doesn't sound plausible, it is very fast to do, which makes it relatively cheap. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.